Hello everybody and welcome back. Thank you very much for joining me. My name is Deborah Hatswell and you're listening to BBR Investigations. Tonight I'm sharing a new report that's come in from two ex-police officers who saw hyena-like creatures at RAF Bempton. And if you stick around to the end, I'll be sharing some new information on the cases up at Winter Hill. But first, in early spring of 2021, I visited Bempton Cliffs to investigate the strange cases that are being reported there. After my visit and the activity I encountered there, I felt there was something brooding and negative in the area that I believe is linked to the land where the old RAF base now sits derelict and ruined. From Danes Dyke to Flamborough Head, and there have been several creature reports and they've been seen close to the base, along with reports of UFOs, strange lights, yellow-eyed beings, human disappearances, and several paranormal and ghost reports. The area and its surrounding towns also have a very high murder rate compared to some areas in the UK. So what is it that haunts the cliffs and shoreline? Is it something as old as time itself? Or is it something that was man-made? or invited to the base. A quick Google image search will show the depraved graffiti that can be found there, left by the strange and deranged people that worship the negative energy. In fact, for me, it was like walking into a wet, mouldy blanket. It took me several years to clear the oppressive effect it had on me, and I'd hazard a guess that other people have remarked on that too. To be honest, I was glad to leave the place behind and I've not returned since and I have no plans to go back and I've avoided working any cases in the area since. But in the same year, two of my friends visited the area and they had an awful experience of their own. It was really scary. When that information was released by me, I was contacted by several other people who shared their own strange experiences. Recently, I sat down with a witness, Gaz, and he explained about an event that happened when he was staying at Wold Farm. And he said, Hi, Deb. I wanted to get in touch with you after you shared the case where two ladies saw some horrible creatures along the cliffs, close to Flamborough Head and RAF Bempton. My partner and I had a remarkably similar experience when we visited there in summer 2022-2023. We were staying at a place called Wold Farm in the camper van which sits between Danesdijk and the cliffs. We were at the top of the farm overlooking the fields. The fields are on a steep incline and then it drops down as it nears the cliff edge. It was at dusk when I saw two creatures that I could not identify in the cornfield. Everything about them was off. The way they moved, the build, and that was what caught my attention. These things had very muscular necks and my brain went through every known animal and they didn't fit with anything here naturally in the UK. One of the creatures was sitting down in the field and it was sat like a dog. It was so big, you could see it above the corn. The second one was running around the first as if they were playing a game of some kind. It was running back and forth and then it had disappeared below the corn and then popped back up again. It was really weird and unnerving seeing them like that. They were around 250 to 300 yards away and they were still huge, even at that distance. My partner and I kept asking each other, what's that, what are they? There was something not right about them and it's hard to explain unless you actually saw them. The one that was running around became aware of us watching it it looked directly at us, and then it did this kind of bluff charge moving towards us. You could see the top of its shoulders and head, and the way it moved was it was almost like it was gliding through the corn. It moved between us and the other creature sitting down. And of course, we both went for our phones to record them, and at that, they were gone. In hindsight, I wish I'd walked out there to get a better perspective of the whole event. There may have been signs in the corn, you know, signs of disturbance, of prints, etc. But I didn't, and I'm not sure why. These things were thick with muscle, and the muscle at the neck made them look like hyenas. 
The ears were visible, but not huge like a wolf's. Both my partner and I are ex-police, and I would say we're both good at remembering the details of a scene, and we're not prone to flights of fancy. We both have no idea what these things were. Most people would tell us they were just deer in the field, but we know they weren't. They didn't look like deer and move like deer at all. And as I said, one of them ran in our direction, I think, in an attempt to scare us off. That's not the behaviour of deer. After all this happened, I went back up to the cliffs to meet Paul Sinclair and Bob Brown. And while we were out there, we saw a strange set of ice iron that was watching us. Earlier in the evening, we met with Bob and Paul at one of the viewing stations for the RSPB. And then we walked to Flamborough Head. It was around dusk again, so we were wearing head torches. And obviously those steps that lead down to the bay are really dodgy. You know, it was a bit hairy walking down there. We walked past Ainsdyke and Paul and Bob explained where each place was. It was a really enjoyable experience. We felt fine. But as we got closer and closer to Bempton Cliffs, I started to get that gut feeling that something wasn't right. I felt really off. So I kept telling myself it was just because of my previous experience with the creatures in the field and knowing all of the things that happened there. I shrugged it off and I thought it'd pass in a minute, but it didn't. I just kept ignoring it. The grass is quite long along that walk, but someone had cut in a path to make it easier to walk. And we followed that path as it was getting darker by the minute. I saw something further along the path and I realised it was eye shine. And like before, I shrugged it off as a possible hair or something. The eyes kept bobbing up and down and it was watching us, literally keeping an eye on us as we walked. Neither of us are windbags, but we decided at that point to trace our steps and walk the long way around. We both seen some hard and unforgettable things during our time in the force. But that night, I did feel fear. The next day, my eyes were so sore, as if they'd been in contact with CS gas. They were red and weeping, and that got worse as the day wore on. My partner suggested that it could be an allergy of some kind. I don't suffer from hay fever or anything like that. My eyes were red raw, they were really painful. I even questioned whether some chemicals had been dumped to spill there and that was what was affecting Mr Badley. The whole place just feels off. I should have taken a photograph of my eyes but I didn't think to do that at the time. At this point in our chat I let Gaz know that I had a similar problem on my visit. I was fine for the first 48 hours or so and then my lips began to chap, like not a light chap either. They were open and sore and bleeding. My friend Deb Singleton thought it was the sea air possibly, but I've been to every part of the coast in the UK and I've never suffered anything like that before. I had to buy some treatment for them as they were so chapped and ulcerated by the time I got home. I was having trouble eating. In fact, I had to cancel two live streams until they cleared. I have no idea why that happened or even how. I know salt air can be hard on your skin, but I've never had a reaction like that before or since. In fact, I've been up winter hill in all weathers, watching the storms come in from the coast, and you can smell the salt in the air, and my lips have always been fine. I should explain for some context that it took me three years to feel well again after my visit to Bempton. Gaz had the same gut reaction I had, and I also ignored it. I was really keen to go up there and see the areas where the accounts had taken place. We stayed at a lovely site. The cliff tops are beautiful. The area is amazing. We visited them in daylight so we could see where we were putting our feet. And in the evening, things were different. It felt different. And I walked in the opposite direction of the others as I didn't like the feel of the place. Several people saw eye shine and two investigators saw two Similar creatures to Gaz during the night investigation. Thankfully, I didn't take part in any of that. I felt so ill, I stayed back at the caravan. I was chatting with Deb Simpleton on the caravan steps because the previous night we both felt that someone was rushing up behind us 
and when Deb turned around to look, there was nobody there. While we were sat on the step chatting, we saw something tall and dark and it moved incredibly fast between the rows of caravans. It was early spring and the weather was pretty brisk and there were hardly any people on the site. To be honest, I couldn't wait to leave and go home as it zapped my energy completely. I just wasn't myself and I wasn't for a long time after that event. I honestly believe there's an oppressive energy there. Something feels as if it's been trapped there against its will and it has an effect on people who visit there. The only other place that has ever made me feel that sick was Canic Chase and I refuse to go back there also. I asked Gaz if he had any other experiences like this that had happened before his visit to Bempton and he shared an experience he'd had camping as a boy, not that far from Canic Chase. Gaz said, years ago when I was a school kid, we used to go on trips to the Four Counties Canal Ring. Now, the Four Counties Canal Ring is a waterway cruise and it links the Shropshire Canal, the Trent and the Mersey Canal and the Staffordshire and Worcester Canal. It passes through the four counties, Staffordshire, Shropshire, Cheshire and the West Midlands. Hot spots for cryptids. The Canal Ring navigates about 110 miles of rural canals through three or four counties. He said, one time there were probably around five of us kids and a couple of teachers. We used to moor at a certain spot close to this huge stately home. I can't remember the name of it now, but it was one of our regular stops, Deb. It was lovely and quiet down there. We hardly saw any people. There was an old ornate bridge that took you across to the stately home. There was one night when we were sitting outside the boat just chatting and enjoying ourselves and some people appeared walking across the bridge. They were in robes carrying candles and even the teacher was a bit perturbed. We asked him what they were, you know, what they were doing. He had no idea but he asked us all to get into the boat just to be on the safe side and we locked down for the night. When I think back on that, I wonder if they were worshipping something in the area. I actually have a report from Canic Chase from near, I think it's Mill Lane Bridge, um, where five robed figures were spotted by a homeless man. And when they'd gone and he looked, there were five dead ducks on the ground. Gaz said, you shared a report from Nipersler not too long ago now, Deb, where you explained about the possible connection between paranormal activity and the natural ley lines that cover the UK. You mentioned an area called Bosley Cloud, and I used to live quite close by there about 15 years ago, and the area is really weird. We'd often see military helicopters in that area. Now, talking with Gaz reminded me of so many other reports that I've taken from all across the UK. There are several reports where the witness describes a creature they saw as hyena-like. They describe the creature as having a thickly muscled neck and upper body. They're often seen with yellow or orange eye shine. And the way the creature moved through the area is something that others have mentioned. This gliding movement where the head doesn't bob. It stays on level at all times. In previous cases at RAF Bempton, there is mention of that fluid motion. Emma and Sarah were the witnesses who tried to film the creatures at Bempton and they remarked on how those creatures they saw did not move like deer. Deer have a pretty distinctive run and it does not match the creatures seen on or around the base. A year before Gaz and his partner visited, I received a report via YouTube from a listener who had their own experience with a strange creature known as the Beast of Bempton. Camilla Marr said, I saw your post on the Beast of Benton and I wanted to share an experience with you that happened to me on a visit to the area in 2021. I saw a big set of orange eyes that were just watching us from about 10 to 12 metres away. The eyes watched us and they were just staring at us in the dark. This was at Flamborough Head and I saw them very close to the lighthouse. I've searched on the internet for any eyes of any animal that might resemble what I saw. 
but I can't find any. Whatever it was, it seemed to be stalking us as it kept itself flat to the floor at all times. I'd go so far as to say that the look in the eyes of this creature confirmed that. By the time I swung my torch a second time, that creature had flanked us and was making a retreat, as by that point, I only saw the eyes moving off sideways. Despite the torchlight, I never even glimpsed a body. So I'm presuming it was a very dark colour and kind of blended into the poor light and its surroundings. It's been a year since I saw it and I still have no idea as to what it was. One man who asked me to keep his identity secret shared with me his own experiences out on Benton Cliffs after he visited in the hopes of seeing the Benton Beast. He said going there was the worst mistake of his life and he's convinced something followed him home from that base. He explained that since the visit, he struggled with his mental health to the point that he's lost his job. He's drinking excessively. His marriage and definitely his sanity are going down the drain. He's been plagued by shadow beings in and around his home that don't try to hide from him. He hears growls and snarls coming from the corners of his room and visitors comment on a feeling of foreboding when they're there. Two of his friends no longer visit after they felt constantly depressed and fatigued when they're at the home. He has gone from an outgoing adventurist who was never home to a man filled with the futility of life. His efforts are now directed at fending off this bastard being, as he calls it, and it has become all-consuming for him. He is often in a state of complete confusion and he feels very fatigued, even though he has no physical health issues. Gaz mentioned the way the creature he saw moved and that he was inspired to contact me after hearing what happened to Emma and Sarah when they visited. Sarah felt a heavy sense of foreboding, even on the drive in. The girls parked along Cliff Lane just before dusk and round about 7.46 and they set off to one of the RSPB viewing spots. Emma said, we were parked up, but felt fine. It was still light then, a couple of people walking the cliffs are out birding. We are enjoying the evening, talking lots as we do. We had a torch with us and we reached as far as the Jubilee viewing point, probably around quarter to nine. The crescent moon was low and it was bright and it was then darkening quickly by this point. Our eyes must have been used to it. However, as opposed to the camera or the phone, I turned and I started to ask if we should turn around and head back because I didn't want to walk too far in the dark. And as I said that, I saw something on the horizon in the fields. I said to Sarah, what's that? And I kept looking at it. And then I realised there were two of them and then another. They were absolutely huge, as big as bears in their bodies. But they were on four legs as they were running from right to left. They ran past the bushes at one side, across the field on the horizon. But they weren't bears, clearly, nor were the cows or deer. The gait and the way they moved were so weird. They just didn't run like you'd expect an animal on four legs to run. We have no idea what they were. But this feeling of dread came over us both. Sarah felt it more and she explained that she was picking up on a canine energy. So I was trying to keep calm, trying to think rationally. Whatever they were, we couldn't tell. And then they would run and stop and try and hide us. And then they'd run again. I was still trying to determine whether they could be livestock. And we decided we needed to go back to the area in better light and check. So on Friday evening we returned when it was much lighter, about 6pm. We stood in the same place we were standing and we even went into the field to the spot where we saw them because we had to come up with an explanation for all this and there was none. Firstly, there's no livestock in that field and half the fences are down. So there's no way there would have been on that day. At the old RAF base there are large cows but they're fenced in close to the buildings. The only animal I saw out there was a hare and a couple of pheasants. I can't explain what we saw. 
one of these things looked directly at me and I caught a big, bright, white eye shine. I don't know what they were, Deb, but that place is definitely eerie. And we even felt the energy change on Friday as we approached the area once more, though we didn't stay until late to watch. Sarah said she could feel an energy, an angry energy, that felt like an alpha canine or something that, you know, was in charge, as she said. She felt that anger not long before falling and cutting her leg open. Hence was leaving while it was still light. We met up with a woman there who was walking a dog and remarked that she hadn't seen any pheasants or hare on the cliffs. And I explained what had happened last night when we saw the creatures. I explained that I had no idea what they were. She immediately told me that she was at Bempton Pond in 2021 walking her dog. And she saw an animal about 50 metres away that was black and on four legs. She first said she thought it was some kind of big black cat, but then said it looked like a dog in the face. After speaking with Gaz, I asked if it was okay if I sent his report across to Emma and Sarah, as I felt that what he'd seen validated their own, and vice versa. Emma got back to me straight away, and she had some really good points and questions that I wanted to share with you all. And She said, I've just read the report made by Gaz and I feel like my blood's run cold. I literally have shivers everywhere. Knowing that other people are seeing strange creatures in the area, that it happened to us in, only compounds the feeling of intrigue. In wonder, you know. It ups the anxiety I felt that evening when Sarah and I were at Bempton. Just as the witnesses here state, it's difficult to describe the creature well, because your brain wants to identify them based upon your existing knowledge. And then confusion sets in when you're unable to. Or, as you state in one of your recent videos, Deb, how do you name an unnameable thing? The fact that the witnesses are ex-police, trained to remember as much information as possible, also describe the movements of the creatures they saw as being off and gliding, again, reminds me of the strange movements of the creatures we saw. Their gait was definitely off. It makes me ask questions like, has anyone else seen them in daylight or up close and personal? Do they only come out in the dark? Where do they live or hide? How are they able to evade detection? And more importantly, do they have any intentions other than minding their own business? I have so many other questions, Emma said, but I'm not sure we'll have any other answers to them except through more and more people speaking up, being brave enough to provide their own accounts of these sightings. So thank you to these and all of the witnesses coming forward and sharing with everyone. And thank you, Deb, for always keeping going, being a support for everyone who needs to be able to speak what they feel may be the unspeakable to others. Even when you're in hospital, you're unwell or you're stuck in bed at home, I know you never stop thinking about others, and I'm always so grateful for you. I've known Emma for several years, and she's joined me on a couple of occasions in areas with a high number of cryptid reports. And this was the first time I've seen her flustered, so to speak. It's not easy being out in the wilds with no one around in bad light when you experience something that is completely impossible to explain. No one's going to come running if you scream. Running is also highly dangerous as the cliffs are highly dangerous, even in good light. And you trigger the prey response. Add to that the idea that something unknown is stalking you, keeping you within its sight at all time. That's beyond unnerving. When I first came back from Bempton, it took me a long time to heal from that place. And some of the reports I took at the time period were sat in draft for a long time, well, I tried to find some kind of normal, sir. One of those reports has stayed with me. It happened in a place I visit every week. I'm often up there in the darkest hours as it's one of the places I visit with Mark for a chill and a sky watch while we have coffee and we discuss the week's events or what we've got coming up. I'm very comfortable up there and I've risen puzzle and bracket there often. But at night, it has a different feel. And those horses in the field become black amorphous shapes that resemble the darkest of creatures. 
it is easy to let my mind slip to the reports I've taken from the area. And it's something I have to push down for sanity's sake. I'm talking about Winter Hill. As most of you know, it's my favourite place to be. But at times, it's hard to push those thoughts down. There are two cases there that also mention unknown creatures with unusual eye shine that is stalking people in the dark. One account came in in October 2020 by a lady that wanted to make a report on behalf of a partner and his friend after they had a terrifying experience when they found strange sheep carcasses up on Winter Hill. That night, the men were around three quarters of a mile away from the Chinese gardens, an area where there is a previous sighting of an upright, hairy humanoid figure known as the Bear Man of Rivington. The men arrived, got the gear from the car and set off. Both had torches, and as they walked, they almost stepped into a carcass of some kind. Shining their torches on it, they both saw a sheep that seemed to have been pulled in half. The sheep carcass was steaming, even with the unshewing rain and the cold night air. Whatever had killed it couldn't be too far away, as this was a very fresh kill. They described the carcass as unusual. The head of the sheep was missing, and the rib cage was snapped in two. Alarmed by this, both men scanned the area around them with torches, looking to see what had growled. And as they were speaking, the growl came again. They quickly scanned the darkness, and one of the men saw a dark, stocky shape that seemed to have reddish coloured eye shine, and it was watching them, and he caught it in his torchlight. The shape dipped out of view and was gone. They both left quickly and got into the car. And even though they were both handy lads, the men felt it would have been an impossible feat to overpower whatever was out there with them. Due to the sheer size of the dark shape and the sound of the growl, they both felt the growl came from something big. The remaining sheep in the field flocked together and looked scared and worried. They were acting really strange. The growling continued all through the event, and it was a loud, rumbling, growling noise. One of the men wondered if this could be a paranormal event, as that growl was so scary, and they both felt watched and stalked all the way back to the car. It was around midnight, on a wet night, and they saw no humans on the way in or out of the area. One of the men said he felt helpless and nervous and it was a sickening feeling, almost like fighting something in the dark. After the event, the men tried to find the growl using known animal recordings here in the UK and they did not find a match with anything. The only sound that matched was the reported noise of a werewolf on a recording on YouTube. Both men agreed the sound was the same as they'd heard that evening. I asked around a few locals and around the farm where I ride, and there'd been no reports of red eye shine or growls at that time. But it wasn't too long before a lady who keeps her horses in the area made a report herself. She was with a number of people at the time of her experience, so they also witnessed the event and were able to corroborate her story. And this took place in 2012. Um, The lady's a local resident and she says, Apologies for taking so long to get back to you with details of my experience, Deb, but I've been really scared since seeing your videos and remembering all the details of what happened to me and my friends. I actually didn't want to think about it, as I have horses that I kept just on the edge of the moors and going up there over winter in the pitch black was nothing but a head torch on is really frightening. And thinking that what I'd seen not two miles away was actually real, as others have seen it. I have been absolutely terrified going up there in the dark early mornings, so it's taken me ages to write down everything for you. My experience happened back in 2012, the night that all the beacons were being lit for the Queen's Jubilee. I lived locally at the time, my other half was working that night, and I'd invited a couple of friends over so that we could go and watch the beacons being lit. We didn't want to be in a mad crush of people as we decided to take our dogs with us. So rather than go into one of the beacons nearby, 
we decided to go up Great Hill to watch from there as we will be able to see a few different ones from that spot like the one over at Rivington, the one at Darwin Tower and Pendle Hill, etc. So for anyone tuning in that doesn't know what the beacons are, when anything of significant happens in the UK, the beacons are lit, um, usually from Scotland all the way down to England. And as each beacon is lit, you see it on the next peak and they light it and so on and so forth. So she said, my friends came over around tea time and we had something to eat. And then we set off with our dogs about an hour before it was due to go dark. I drove my Land Rover up Well Lane to the gate leading onto the moors. And we walked to Great Hill from there. I do remember that it was quite a nice evening. And as I had, stupidly in hindsight, got a pair of flip-flops on and a pair of three-quarter line jeans. We took up a flask of coffee and some crisps and cakes and a radio, you know, so we could have a little party up there. We only realised later on that we'd forgotten to take a torch with us. The first thing that was odd, not at the time, but it sort of made sense later on when I was going over things in my head, was as we got to Great Hill, there was quite a few sheep milling about and they made no attempt to move. My friend's Cairn Terrier wasn't good with livestock and she was worried about not being able to let him off the lead. So as my dog was used to working sheep as we used to live on the farm, I got him to run the sheep off. But I had to do it three times, they kept coming back, which as I said was odd, as they usually say coffee for dogs near and don't come back. Just before it went dark, a bloke on his own turned up with the same idea as us, but he'd come like a proper hiker with a rucksack and a head torch, etc. And then a big group of people came up White Copies Gorge and they joined us. And surprisingly, one of the group was a girl that my two friends and I worked with. We all hung out chatting, listening to music, a big group had fetched beers with them, you know. So we were all getting merry and enjoying ourselves. And our dogs were playing around together and exploring in the dark. I can't remember what time the beacons were lit, but we saw the one over towards Riverdat and, you know, Darwin and Pendle and some in the far distance that may have been in the South Lakes. Quite a few fireworks were also set off in various places. So we stayed to watch those. And then, after about an hour, we all decided to walk back down the hill together. My friend, who had the Cairn Terrier, was having a good chat with a bloke who had turned up alone. We are talking about hiking and camping and fell running and so on, you know, as she was wanting to get into that. And it turned out he'd parked his car in the village. So I made a joke about three unprepared women and I offered, you know, him a lift back down well late to his car in exchange for him lighting the path for us with his head torch. So we all set off. And when we got to the left-hand pathway that leads off the main path down towards White Copies Gorge, we said goodbye to our workmate and all her friends, and they all started trundling off down that other pathway. I do remember saying that I thought they were mad doing that in the dark, as the path is dreadful in spots, but they were laughing about it and just headed off. At this point, I'm walking with my friend Elle and the two dogs were in front of us and my other friend R was walking, chatting to the bloke with the head torch and they had dropped quite a distance behind us. It was dark, but I seem to remember that it was a full moon that night and as the pathway there is a sort of a light coloured stone surface, we could see where we were going, so rather than hang about for them, we just strolled on with the dogs. The voices of the other groups going down the gorge were now quite faint. We'd been able to hear them laughing and talking until they dropped below the level of the flat bit of moors on our left. So now, all we could hear were the two dogs mooching about and our friend R and a new pal chatting away behind us. I'm not sure how far behind us they were by now. I'm going to guess around 100 feet or so. Although we could hear them chatting, they weren't close enough for us to hear what they were talking about just the sound of their voices, and the light of his head torch wasn't lighting anything up for us. I remember glancing back and had a bit of giggle with Elle, joking that it looks like ours pulled, and I turned back to look in the direction we were going. I walked straight into my dog and nearly fell over. He was standing rigid, looking off to the left, and all his hackles were up. Ours dog was also standing stock still, at his side, looking in the same direction but her tail was tucked right underneath her back legs. And I started to tell him to move, probably something along the lines of, come on, lad, shift she said, or something similar, when I heard a really low growling snarl 
and it was coming from the direction the dogs were looking at. My friend Elle was talking away slightly behind me and she talked really loudly. So I said, what the fuck was that? Did you hear that? And then I said, shut up yapping for a minute, will you? And she tried whispering and said, what? What is it? No, I don't hear anything. And she finished, as she finished talking, I heard it again. And this time she heard it too. Again, you know, I did swear and say, Kinell, is that a dog? The idea of it being a loose dog really panicked me. You know, my dog's a bit of a fighter if he came across another male. But I had nothing to back up with, you know. And my first thought was that if it was a lost dog or something, my dog would end up getting hurt by starting something he couldn't finish. But he wasn't making any move towards it. He wasn't a big dog, but he had balls of steel. And he wasn't afraid of anything. So to see him in a bit of a state of alarm, kind of fear, concern, really spooked me. It felt like ages. It probably wasn't any longer than a minute that we stood there, not moving. So I suggested that we keep walking and try and get past this dog and hope that the dog didn't decide, you know, to leg it after one of ours in the dark or someone, you know, would end up getting hurt. So I nudged him in my foot and I said, go on, get on. And he was literally taking one step forward at a time with very stiff legs, with his tail up like a poker, and never once took his eyes off the spot that we'd heard the growl come from. I guess it was maybe 20 or 30 feet from the path at that point. My friend R and the bloke she was chatting with, you know, had caught up with us quite a bit by then. They seemed totally oblivious to what was going on with us or the dogs. So well, and I walked on a bit slower. And then, a bit more than we'd been doing, and now we had a bit of light from the head torch hitting us and the sides of the path. Both dogs were sticking pretty close a little ways in front of us. But although they were still on alert, they weren't looking as disturbed as they had been. Elle and I started talking quietly about what we just heard. We started trying to rationalise it by saying it must have been the noise floating up from White Copy's Gorge. And it wasn't as close as we thought it'd been and, you know, so on. So we started to relax a bit and we were chatting about nothing much at this point. Suddenly, my dog was once again standing stock still, maybe 10 to 15 feet in front of us. And this time he was growling really low in his throat and his hackles were up from his neck right down to his tail. His tail was poker straight. And my friend's dog was once again at his side. Only this time, she was also doing a lot of low whining. This is right before there's a right-hand bend in the path with a slope to the right. And then you've got the open moors to the left and out in front. And both dogs were looking straight ahead towards the bend. But then both started to turn their bodies towards the right. And they ended up sort of, you know, looking towards the right-hand slope as whatever it was was ahead of us. They both started turning and standing, looking towards the open moor, maybe at the 11 o'clock position from where we were standing. And right at that moment, the two behind us had got close enough that the head torch was hitting the moors in that direction. And I saw a big, dark shape that I actually thought was a cow. I know, really dark, there's no cows up there. But that was my first thought. And it darted across the line of light and it headed in the direction we were going. At the same time, as both dogs followed the direction it had gone with their heads and then their bodies. Elle saw it too and I lost it. At this point, I was really scared and I was shouting to the other two, did you see that? And what the fuck was that? But the bloke said he hadn't seen anything. And I sort of shrugged as if she didn't know what I was on about. So I was trying to explain the growling we heard and the shape that we'd seen, and the dogs being freaked out on their behaviour. We got both dogs on their leads, and for the rest of the way back to the car, across the open moors, we stayed as a tight group, as I was insisting we all walk back together with no gaps. The dogs continued watching one side of the moors, and then the other, as though something was moving around us, but we didn't hear anything. No growling, no sign of anything in the heather, but there was definitely something there. I was doing some sort of weird half run, half walk, but wearing flip-flops, I was stubbing my toes on the loose stones and rocks. 
you know, I was trying to make everyone else hurry up so we could get back to the car, maybe two or 300 feet from the car as the pathway starts to drop down. I saw it again, off to the left, where there are some ruins of the old farmhouse. I just saw a big shape on four legs, sort of leap over what's left of what I think is part of the house wall. And then it vanished. And then I heard it growling again, a very low, deep growl, really close to us. So whatever it had been had moved from the ruins up to within maybe 30 feet of us in seconds. I bolted for the gate and locked my car, got everyone inside, locked all the doors and got down that lane as fast as I could. Once back in my house, when it was just these three girls, I admitted she'd heard and seen it too, but didn't want that bloke she was talking to, thinking she was a bit of a dick. So she didn't say anything while we were up there. After a few wines and a lot of chatting, you know, we started convincing ourselves that we'd imagined most of it, as you do. But the following week, when I saw the other girl we worked with and casually asked her if she'd got down the gorge okay, and if they'd heard anything weird, she said, it's funny you should say that, because one of the lads in her group kept saying to the rest of them that he thought someone was following them when they'd first separated from us off the main path. But as they were a bit pissed, they didn't really pay a lot of attention to him. But he was convinced someone was creeping through the grasses off to the side of them. So that's what happened. Knowing that more the way that I do, she must have been absolutely terrified. So for anyone who doesn't know in Eng- living in England, imagine the film, um, what is it, uh, American Werewolf in London? where the men are out on the moors and they see the werewolf. For well, that's exactly what it's like. It's pitch black. There's no lighting up there. You can see the odd light from houses that are set out the way, you know, or the farms or something like that. There isn't anything up there to light other than the moon. And it's a type of place, because it's the elevation, the weather can come in really, really quickly. So I've been up there with Matt, we've been watching the bats and the owls absolutely fine and within 10 minutes we've been sat in the cloud because the mist has come in so quickly. I've rode along Matchmore Lane and it's been complete sunny, lovely weather and as I've got to Wilder's Wood, we literally saw the clouds rolling in over the top of the moor. Absolutely amazing. I have one more report that may feature the same creature experienced by the ladies that night on the hill. And then I'll share the report from a local man who's seen some very strange sights on Winter Hill. Now, on the 16th of Feb, 2021, a gentleman watching one of my recent videos about cases on Winter Hill reported that he had seen a strange figure up near the mast. Now, the mast is a huge transmitter. It had red lights on it so that no aeroplanes can hit it. And even as far as Wales, you can see it. And when you see it, if you live where we live, you know you're almost home. And this chap was on Winter Hill and he was walking his dog. And as we know, you know, other people out with their dogs on the hill had been followed down by something they couldn't make out clearly. Yet they could hear it and the dogs were nervous around it. He said, I was on the bottom of Winter Hill last night. I was out walking with my dog. And as we were walking, I heard a noise that came from the field to my left. My dog was on his lead and the field was up higher than the road we were walking on. I had a spotlight on me and I was shining it across the road and into the fields and I saw her eye shine approximately four feet above the ground. I don't know what animal the eyes belong to, but as I walked, it walked. And when I stopped, it stopped. This pattern happened three times in a row. I'd walked about 50 yards with this animal shadowing along with me and then I lost sight of it. I didn't feel afraid and I'm guessing it could have been a fox. But the behaviour of this animal was strange. I did feel like it was stalking me. And that's very unusual behaviour for a fox, he said. I'd have to agree and say it's very unusual behaviour for a fox. They're not called wily, cunning or sneaky for no reason. Foxes keep very quiet when they're out hunting. And they'll circumvent an area from a wide angle. You know, the safety is paramount for them. And in most cases, when confronted by a human, they run off. Humans are dangerous, they didn't learn that early on. So it tells me whatever was stalking them that night was far bigger than any fox. 
One local man named Simon shared his experience with me via YouTube and he's seen some strange things upon that hill. He said, I work around the Bolton area and I was delivering around Horwich one Saturday morning about 7.30 a.m.-ish. I was looking up the mast, just a quick glance, and something caught my attention. I am sure I saw a big black figure just standing there. I did a double take and it was gone. It was beautiful up there, but very strange. Me and the wife have decided we were going to be going up Rivington searching for clues. Now, we're not expecting to find anything, but I'm sure as I'll be looking for signs. We'll be taking our dog too, so hopefully if there is anything around, he might pick up on it. This subject is just so damn fascinating, and it just goes to show how much we're being lied to by the authorities. Recently, he said, I've noticed some potential signs of Sasquatch or Dogman on the bus track that runs between Tilsley and Lee. At first, I brushed it off, thinking it was just a coincidence in my mind. Anyway, I start work early in the week, and I'm out walking the dog about 1.30am. There's thick brush and woodland in certain areas along that route. And on some mornings, I've heard the sound of branches snapping, as if something big is moving along the embankment on the other side of the footpath. Now, me and the wife have seen deer along there, so again, I'm thinking that's probably what it is. But anyway, yesterday morning, Saturday... My wife took the dog out around 5.30am, got to a certain point on the route when she heard a loud thump and at this point she said the hair on the back of her neck stood up and she got a very strong feeling that she needed to get out of there. My dog is a husker and he wants to stop and sniff every few yards but according to the wife at this point he was pulling her out of there. He doesn't usually do this. I'm not saying they're living along that bush track but we have a lot of green corridors around here and cut acres close by. I've got some pictures of a couple of tree breaks, which are kind of unusual. And as we had no strong winds around here at the time, they stood out. The trees looked a little too thick for kids or people to be breaking. I've been saying to the wife for months that I've noticed some strange sounds going on when I take the dog out early. I was working yesterday morning, so the wife usually takes the dog for a walk on a Saturday. It could be something or nothing. But it certainly raised a few questions in my mind. Anyway, great upload as always. I've learned so much about this fascinating subject thanks to you, Deb, sharing your extensive knowledge on this channel. Keep up the great work, Simon. There's a case up on Winter Hill where a man that was a police inspector from Liverpool lived in one of the houses up on there. And in the middle of the night, he got up to use his toilet and he saw something out on the moor. And he went in and got everybody to pack up and they all moved out of that house. And he stayed with his wife at his daughter's house in central Liverpool. If you saw the beauty of that area, it'd have to be something absolutely terrifying to move you from there into the centre of the city. You know, and I wonder how many other people have had experience like the ones I featured tonight. How many have not shared them publicly and maybe have no intention in ever doing so? But if you're that person, I can assure you, every bit of information we get not only validates it for the previous witnesses, it also brings other witnesses forward. I remember when I first put my head above the parapet and declared I was a British witness to a cryptic creature that wasn't a big cat or an essay. I was hit from all sides even with a bit of friendly fire. Can you imagine if I'd stopped then? There'd be no BBR, no real research into the British Bigfoot. I may not have conquered the subject, but I certainly put us on the map and I will continue to do that. So if you want to share your experience, whether that be privately or publicly, just know there are people out there who will get every word that you say as they too have an unexplained experience and are looking for the same answers as you. No matter where I am in the world or what project I'm working on, I will never forget the early days. And I tell myself daily, there are others who are dying to breach the trenches like myself and find out their answers for themselves. And we are all here to help with that. Tonight, I want to thank the witnesses, but I want to give a special thank you to Jojo Weeks, who's been there for me when I've been ready to shut up shop and retire. She's my listening ear, my friend and supporter, 
along with modding all of my shows, finding witnesses and articles for me, whilst creating digital images that you see on the videos. It's a lot of work and I appreciate everything she does to help me personally and professionally and I am very grateful to have her as a friend at my side and I am grateful to all of my regular listeners and to the newcomers. So I will be back next week at the same time with more reports from the BBI case files. Good night, everyone.